Good evening. So glad to see you all here. And she didn't um, hide out after we went back to our winter weather from the brief uh, spring we had here earlier this week. My name is Samuel W. Black. I am the director of the African American program here at the John Hines History Center, and welcome to our ninth annual Black History Month lecture. We're really pleased. This is sort of for the African American program. This event is uh, sort of like the cornerstone of our programs. We always present uh, an African American scholar or producer. Uh, with a product, and then tonight's product is, of course, the Black Fives uh, book, and I hope you get your copy. If they sell out during the program, then you'll have to come back and visit our bookstore or get it online, but that means you won't get it signed by our speaker, so make sure you pick it up tonight. Um, just a few things. Um, the way that we're going to do this tonight, I'm going to... Um, introduce one of our special guests who's going to introduce our speaker, Claude Johnson. Uh, and then Claude's going to do his presentation. Uh, he's going to talk about the early uh, period of basketball, especially in African-American uh, basketball in the early 20th century, in which Pittsburgh played a major role um, in basketball. As many of you know, the legacy of Chuck Cooper and others, but there was a generation or two that preceded Chuck Cooper. So I don't want to get into Clive's lecture uh, here tonight, so I'll let him talk all about that. Um, but here at the History Center, we do have a few things that are upcoming. If you have not heard, you probably have not because we haven't sent out the information yet, but we will be opening a new exhibition in collaboration with the Smithsonian Institution um, called the Negro Motorist Green Book. And that's going to open on May 13th. It's going to close on August 13th. Um, we're real excited about it because we are adding about 40 to 45 percent of the content uh, to this exhibit from the Smithsonian. And that content is going to be focused directly on Pittsburgh. So it's going to be a lot uh, that you will be able to learn um, about uh, Pittsburgh during this mid 20th century, 1936 to 1966. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce our um, special guest who's going to introduce our speaker. Our special guest is Rob Ruck, who's professor at the History Department at the University of Pittsburgh. He teaches sports and urban history at Pitt, amongst a number of other things. Uh, he's one of the leading historians there. Uh, he received his Ph.D. from Pitt in 1983. His numerous publications include Tropic of Football, The Long and Perilous Journey of Samoans in an NFL, Race Ball, How the Major Leagues Colonized the Black and Latin Game, Rooney, A Sporting Life, that was published with Maggie Jones Patterson, his wife, and Michael Weber, uh, The Republic of Baseball, Dominican, Giants of the American Game, The Tropic of Baseball, Baseball in the Dominican Republic, Sandlot Seasons, Sport in Black Pittsburgh. And if you haven't read that book or uh, don't have a copy of it, we do have it in our gift shop. And um, uh, But it is a must read if you enjoy learning and involving yourself with the history a sport in Pittsburgh, and especially amongst African Americans. Uh, Steve Nelson, American Radical, um, with Steve Nelson and James Barrett. There's an early 1981 publication. So in addition to being a scholar at the University of Pittsburgh, Rob has been an advisor to us at the History Center through the Western Pennsylvania Sports Museum and an advocate for the Baseball Hall of Fame um, and quietly campaigned for Come Posey um, to be inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, Scott's going to, Claude's going to talk about Come Posey, so I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to ruin anything. Uh, so without further ado, will you please welcome Professor Rob Rupp.
Thanks, Sam. That's longer than my introduction of Claude. I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine that you stumbled on a fascinating story that you realize would resonate, particularly in this country where sport is at the core of daily life in many ways. A story that had been not only neglected, but largely forgotten for decades. And you realized that that story has significance, that when you looked at it within the context of the botched effort at reconstruction after the Civil War, the great migration of African Americans out of the South through the culmination of the civil rights struggles in the 50s and 60s, and then imagine you walk into my office at Pitt and tell me you're going to write this story and tell it to the world. But you'd never written a book before. And as you begin, you find out this story is far more complex than you anticipated. But you stick with it. You travel around the country. You spend years researching, interviewing, and while you're at it, you begin to tell the story in bits and pieces, through lectures, through articles, through interviews, ultimately on the web. And you even create a foundation so that this story has legs, that it goes somewhere. And imagine that you begin to convince the descendants and beneficiaries of this history. What's at stake? You understand what it means for Nike and Puma, but also college athletic conferences and the NBA. And you finally convinced the Hall of Fame, the Basketball Hall of Fame, to induct some of the people that you've been talking about. And along the way, you raise three sons who are doing tremendous work in the classroom and aren't too bad athletically either. One captains the defensive backfield at San Diego State. The other is Michigan's leading wide receiver and has been in the last two NCAA uh, playoff Final Four. Uh, and the youngest, who is about to enter the U.S. Naval Academy and play basketball. And finally, imagine that you finish that book and you find that it's already inspiring and changing the discussion about history, about race, about sport. Pretty impressive journey, no? It's one that began in Vienna, Austria, where Claude Johnson was born to a mother from Frankfurt, Germany, and a father from the south side of Chicago. It continued in the Congo, where he lived until he was six years old, and the family moved to the United States. It went on through years at Carnegie Mellon, where he earned degrees in civil engineering and economics, and a master's in mechanical engineering at Stanford, through executive positions at IBM and American Express, MBA Properties, Nike and the Fat Farm, and that journey would bring him many, many times to Pittsburgh. I am delighted and honored to introduce the man who began that journey and brought it to this conclusion, Claude Johnson. Thank you. Oh, man. I mean... Thank you, Rob. Uh, I'm kind of speechless because uh, first I have to put this timer on because I can probably start talking about this topic for nine straight hours or 28 straight hours. So I'm going to just put the timer on here so I see how I'm going. Um, thank you very, very much for coming out and for your interest in this topic and making the time to, to be here. It's an honor for me to be here. And also it's a, it's a poignant full circle moment 
because what Rob is talking about is that uh, years ago I came to Pittsburgh. This was probably more than 20 years ago. And uh, I called Rob and I, because I, I had read his book, Sandlot Seasons, which is a seminal piece of work on not only sport in basketball, but the significance of sport in basketball, black sports, the significance of the African-American journey in Pittsburgh, which is extremely unique. And it helped me to realize, wow, there's something here that is more than just, oh, there's a few teams and they're interesting and let me write, start writing about them. But I didn't know anything about how to do that. So I called Rob and he agreed to meet me at the Starbucks on Forbes Avenue. <laughs> this had to be 19 something, right? 19, 1990 something. And, um, you know, he encouraged me the whole time, every time we talked from then on, how's the book going? Have you written the book yet? Did you get, it, you know, what's going on? How does, and so I, I spent a lot of time at the very beginning of this journey, um, um, speaking with Rob, but also listening to his encouragement and um, learning how to be a historian and learning how to write and learning how to read and just um, research, um, which is not a given. Uh, and this was before um, articles were digitized. So I had to figure that all out, but I don't want to get ahead of myself other than just to say, first of all, thank you, Rob. Rob is in my acknowledgments and um, it's, not just, it's not just words, so he, he's, he knows my family. He knows our journey <laughs> inside and out. So thank you for that. And Maggie as well. Um, so this is the book. It's the epic story of basketball's forgotten era, the Black Fives. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what are the Black Fives? Why were they forgotten? Why is this an epic story? What happened? And then I'm going to focus it a lot on Pittsburgh, even though it has uh, a greater span than Pittsburgh. Um, but uh, the way this all began um, was that at a certain point, I was working at the NBA. I was in charge of uh, international licensing for the NBA and the Consumer Products Division, which is all the logos and uh, licensees um, that they have overseas. And in 1996, when they were celebrating what they called their 50th anniversary, they came out with this book, which is an 800-page book. But I had read Arthur Ashe's book, A Hard Road to Glory, and in the 800-page book, there were only three pages devoted to earlier African-American basketball teams. But in Arthur Ashe's book, he mentioned several teams, maybe a dozen. One of them was the Smart Set Athletic Club of Brooklyn, which was an all-black social and athletic club that was formed in 1904. And I was living in Brooklyn at the time. And I thought, wait, why, why don't I know about this? Why don't anybody know about this? I'm smart, I'm athletic, I live in Brooklyn, I'm social. Um, that's like my club. You know, where'd it go? <laughs> what happened? And it started me on this quest because not only did I think that people should know about this, but also I felt like I had discovered gold felt like I had discovered some, like a, a gem on the beach um, while I was just walking. And uh, not only that, but because I was in licensing, I saw myself wearing Smart Set Athletic Club t-shirt one day, right? Um, along the way, I started to collect artifacts and learn what was going on at the beginning. And so my research uh, brought me across, you know, uh, I came across different graphs like this, which helped me to understand why these positions were named the way that they're named. Why are, why is there a left forward? What, why, what, what's, what, what is it with these names? Like, why are they called forwards? We all know that there's forwards, but why, why are they called guards? It's because the center was always needed after every made field goal in the early days because you had to jump ball after every made field goal. And so if you had to jump after every made field goal, that meant that you could keep possession of the ball the entire game, theoretically. 
Um, so that person had to make sure that they, you know, had leaping ability. Once they got the ball, you would pass the ball up court to the forward because he was forward. You pass the ball forward to the forward. The guards would defend their basket. That's why they were called guards because they're guarding the basket. Now today, obviously, there's no such thing as a left and a right and all that stuff, but now you know where these positions came from. And this is, I'm telling you this because, not just because I want to convey the information now, but this is part of what we do when we, when we talk to schools and, and uh, teams. Um, I just spent uh, most of January presenting this entire history to every single men's and women's team in the Big East. So that's 22 teams, the players. So these are the future NBA players, future leaders, uh, future platform. And, you know, that's the way to get at this history is to make it be unburied, right? Or to unbury it. The, ball, the basket did not have an opening at the beginning. The referee had to take the ball out and do the center jump after each made basket. It helped me to answer the question, why is the basket 10 feet off the floor? And it's because when James Naismith originally nailed the peach basket to uh, the running track at the YMCA, the running track is 10 feet off the floor. So if it wasn't for an architect, more of us would be able to dunk today, right? <laughs> um, the jersey is called a jersey because... In the earliest days of uniforms, there was a special kind of knit that was innovated on the Isle of Jersey in the English Channel, and that became known as the Jersey Knit. And so that's why jerseys are called jerseys, because of the Jersey Knit, because of the English Channel. Over the years, I started to collect artifacts. Um, a lot of them came off of eBay because Nobody cared. Nobody knew about it. People were selling stuff, $1.99, um, and I was bidding on it, and I, I just started collecting gear, basketballs, ticket stubs, uh, letterheads, all kinds of things. And so now we have the largest collection of, of artifacts from this period in the world, uh, more than a 1,000 items. They've been on display at the... LBJ Presidential Library at the uh, New York City Historical Society Museum, the Museum of the City of New York, and we even have an online museum now that's sponsored by uh, Puma, who we're partnered with. The book focuses on how black basketball emerged in four different cities. New York City, which includes Brooklyn, Harlem, and, and Midtown, uh, Washington, D.C., Chicago, and Pittsburgh. And it's not just because we're including Pittsburgh for the sake of having four. It's because Pittsburgh really was a dominant hub of black basketball, a pivotal center, partly because already Rob has mentioned some of it in his books, but also... Uh, for some reasons that I uncovered in terms of the research that I did. And it all centers on this man named Cumberland Posey Jr., who people know about because of the Homestead Grays. And there's a lot that's been written about him, and he was a heroic, pivotal figure, an entrepreneur, and the architect of black sport in Pittsburgh, as, as Rob has said in his In Sandlot Seasons. But he also was this amazing basketball player and a thinker along those lines. One of the reasons is that his father, Cumberland Posey Sr., was an amazing entrepreneur in his own right. Uh, the family um, was started in Ohio, a Athens, Ohio, along the Ohio River. Um, and uh, Cumberland Posey Sr. was a river man that meant uh, he, the reason why was because he was the first known African-American with a, a steamboat engineer's license. You, you had to get this license and it was an official certification. And once he got that, he started building steamboats. 
and he became known as this man who, through his company and his value system and quality of his work, uh, built some of the best ships on the river. And he became so well known that by the time he moved up to Pittsburgh, he was able to um, partner up with some of the major figures in shipping and coal and entrepreneurship and industrial uh, industrial life on the river in Pittsburgh. They moved to Homestead. So he immediately got friendly with the Hayes family in Homestead. And they owned boats and coal mines, and suddenly he was shipping their coal and, and building boats for them. Um, and he also had a partnership and contracts with Carnegie Steel. And he immediately took his revenue from these entrepreneurial ventures and bought land in Homestead. That land was so um, vast, really, that eventually Homestead uh, Steel, which was the Homestead Works in, in Homestead, owned by Carnegie Brothers Steel, purchased his land. They, had to, they, they purchased his land because they were trying to expand and they had to, there was no other way to expand but to buy Posey's uh, property. Uh, which was on Second Street. It doesn't exist anymore, but it's where that mall is now. So I went to the city and county building, and I was there for a week or so, and I found the deed of sale uh, from uh, Cumberland Posey Sr. and his wife Anna uh, to, um, to Carnegie Brothers Steel, which was really amazing because it's all handwritten. If you've ever been up there, volumes and volumes and volumes of handwritten deeds and records of sale. But what happened with Cumberland Posey is that he could have gone to work for his dad, but instead he opted to play sports. Um, he won the city championship while he was at Homestead High School basketball, but he was also a great football player. Um, and, uh, and baseball player. But in basketball, he ended up really becoming this mythical figure because he, he foresaw something that nobody else did. Pittsburgh at the time um, was a center for black labor because in 1892, after the Homestead Steel Strike, when the amalgamated union was essentially crushed, they previously didn't allow black labor into the union. So after that strike happened with, if you remember, the Pinkerton, Pinkerton detectives came up river in two steamboats and, uh, and, and there were shots fired and people died. And after that, black people started coming to Pittsburgh because they could be hired in large numbers. And so that meant there was money uh, because of payrolls and, Black communities started to form, Homestead, Homewood, the Hill District. And at that exact same time, uh, there was this great migration out of the South of African Americans trying to escape the oppression uh, down there. So Pittsburgh actually became a black hub uh, during that time. Pittsburgh already was the leading industrial power in the world. They led in steel manufacturing, glass, harnesses, rivets, like every possible thing you would need to build came out of Pittsburgh. Saddles for horses, everything. And um, into this mix uh, comes Cumberland Posey, who uh, starts to realize, let's build a team. And he's already involved in sports, but now he wants to build a basketball team. So he recruits players. And the thing about Pittsburgh is that Pittsburgh has many, many, many hills. The hills are separated by steep ravines. And kind of as a way of thinking about it, the melting pot uh, sim uh, metaphor suggests that you can put many different ingredients together that are vastly different put them under great pressure and heat and create something new that's stronger and better than what you started with the individual pieces. And that's how steel is made. 
But it's also how people are made. And that's how Pittsburgh is made. Because here you have these hills, Polish Hill, German Hill, the Hill District, Jewish, Lithuanian, all kinds of different mixtures. And they somehow have this desire to connect and be together because they're already working elbow to elbow in the steel mills. But there's these ravines. So they build something like 460 bridges, the most bridges in the world. So, so the nickname for Pittsburgh was the Smoky City, but it was also the city of bridges. And where you couldn't use a bridge, they built stairways down into the ravines and up the other side. So there were over 700 stair stairways, the most of any city in the United States. Something like 30,000 vertical feet of stair, the most in the United States. So bottom line is people tried to get together and connect in Pittsburgh. It's a very unique city for that reason. And so if you wanted to play a team, you literally had to conquer another hill. It's another hill to conquer. That's what that meant. But because of these hills, there were also very few flat surfaces, so they didn't have parks to play. There was, Pittsburgh was one of the last cities to actually have parks, and, that, and they also didn't have uh, a field house or a place to play basketball. Um, I know this is very blurry, but this is a, a typical iron and steel jungle gym. And if you, if you look at this, there's black and white kids, and they're probably about to break their necks, collarbones, craniums, and everything, right? Just imagine. But what's worse is, look in the background, there's a high voltage pole. <laughs> so all it has to do is fall on this thing, and all these kids are gone, vaporized instantly. But this is what kids did um, until they built Washington Park. And this is, and they built a field house there, the Washington Park Field House. And this is, uh, you might not be able to tell, but it's where the, it's where the uh, Civic Arena eventually ended up, that field. In the background, uh, back there is Union Station in downtown Pittsburgh. But the gym itself was um, state of the art, and it and it helped enable Cumberland Posey and others to start practicing basketball. This was in 1904. Now, the gym was so crowded that you really couldn't form a team. But what Cum Posey did is one of the guys on the team was a janitor named James Dorsey, Big Jim Dorsey. And guess where he was a janitor? At the state-of-the-art new facility on the north side called the Phipps Physical Culture School, which contained an amazing gymnasium, a library full of books on physical culture. And so in this gym, on weekends, Big Jim Dorsey would let his friends in because he had the key, because he was the janitor. And they would practice, and they would read up on the different rules to the point where nobody really knew about them when they invited Howard University. They had the audacity to invite Howard University, who were the reigning black national champions, undefeated, considered invincible, to Pittsburgh. They were considered a joke. The newspapers down in DC and the Howard University Journal thought, okay, we're just gonna go show them how basketball is played in polite circles. And so um, little did they know that what Composi and his friends were practicing was not only the rules, because there were two different sets of rules back then. There was the rule where you could dribble and catch the ball with two hands and keep backing up and body your defender right to the rim and then turn around and score. That was the professional rules. And then the amateur rule where you could dribble with one hand and you weren't allowed to catch the ball because that would be a double dribble, just like today. But if you dribbled, you couldn't shoot the ball anymore. So you had to, there was a premium on moving without the ball, catching the ball, spot up shooters, etc. So Clay Thompson, uh, Steph Curry, guys like that would have thrived. But, they, but there was no such thing as a long distance shot yet until Cumberland Posey brought that out in the game against Howard, because that's what they were practicing in this gym. 
and the newspapers talk about how they would take these shots from half court. And it's the first time that's ever been recorded. So I go on to talk about that in my book as to why this innovation was so important. And obviously, fast forwarding today, the the predecessor of that or the direct family tree lineage goes to Cumberland Posey. This, by the way, was on the same street where Phipps and Andrew Carnegie both grew up on the same same street, right, right up here on the north side. Um, and so here's this team, and Jim Dorsey is on the, he's kneeling on the far left. Uh, Cumberland Posey is next to him, and there's some other players and um, the coach and the manager. And so they start touring around because after they beat Howard, now they're making headlines, and now people want to come play them. So they're visiting Pittsburgh, and then they're getting invited to New York City and elsewhere. And now all of a sudden it's on. Now all of a sudden Pittsburgh is the place to be for basketball. You have rooters and fans who are coming to games. Monte Monticello, by the way, was named after the street in Homewood uh, where uh, some of the uh, original founders of the team and of the Pittsburgh Courier lived. Robert Van moved there. And you have advertisements because right around this time, the phonograph and radio became commercially available. That meant that music, especially ragtime music, became popular. Before this, you could only play sheet music on a, on a player piano or in your parlor. You could have a piano. Very few people had an actual orchestra in their living room. But that meant people wanted to dance. And so enterprising African-American basketball promoters said, wait, let's put these concepts together. Here's an empty ballroom. Let's bring an orchestra playing ragtime music, which was the first time that African-American musical talent could be featured this way. Um, and let's have them play music before the game, during halftime, and after the game. So basketball games and dance, all these early advertisements would show those words together. And it was really intriguing to me because I thought, huh, maybe this was an African-American innovation to marry music and the game of basketball, which now today is just commonplace. Every single practice has music. Every single game has music. Every time out, even while, while, they're, while the ball's in play, there's music. Um, there's almost too much music sometimes. It's definitely too loud half the time. But um, it gave a beat to the game, right? So here you have the Monticello Athletic As uh, Asso Association, even though it says athletic club, playing the Alpha Physical Culture Club, which was the first African-American athletic club in the country. And it's on Christmas night. Um, it's at a place called the Manhattan Casino in uh, New York City in Harlem. And if you look at the address, 155th and 8th, that's the precise intersection where Rucker Park is today. It was literally across the street. On the other side of the intersection was the polo grounds. So you can just imagine what, what life was like at that point in terms of being a sports fan uptown in Harlem. The admission of 50 cents, boxes were $3.00. By the time you got to this um, 1912 era, um, there were, there were 6,000 fans or so coming to these games. That's how much the Manhattan Casino could hold. The rent for a four-bedroom apartment in New York City was $25 a month. So this was a lot of money. And people started wondering, well, where's that money? How's that money getting split up? And it was Cumberland Posey, as well as a couple of others, who started realizing, well, wait, since we have this money, and since the more talented and the better we are, the more competitive we are, the more people come, let's pay our players and let's recruit players from out of town. So he was the first African-American basketball entrepreneur to import players, to import talent, which was a, a unique proposition back then because there was a battle between the amateur forces, the forces that wanted to keep the game amateur, and those that felt it could be professional. 
because there was enough money for professionalism. That's because basketball was invented in the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association, which meant that because of their logo, Mind, Body, and Spirit, um, it was really for wellness and for holistic spirituality and, and to keep uh, especially male youth from moral decay in the winter months it meant, what do we do after football? Um, and so when uh, Luther Gulick gave that assignment to James Naismith at the International uh, Training School in Springfield, Massachusetts, that was his assignment, is to come up with something that's indoor, that's active, that's um, intense, uh, but not necessarily violent like football. That's how basketball was created. But Luther Gulick learned about physical culture from a man named Dudley Allen Sargent who invented the idea of just phys ed, um, physical culture. They called it muscular Christianity. This was when the YMCA was first developing. And they uh, evolved because in London because of a similar problem that was happening in the, in the United States. It was that the Industrial Revolution was causing people from agricultural rural, rural areas to move into the city, and it caused lots of social problems, including just congestion. That was happening in New York City and other places, and in New York especially, the mortality rate among African Americans was 25% from uh, tuberculosis and pneumonia. And black leaders didn't know, and medical leaders didn't know at the time, that this was, these were contagious diseases. They thought it was just, we don't get enough lung exercise. So they immediately looked to the YMCA and other social reform organizations and thought, okay, well, basketball might be a good, a good way to help with that. So when basketball first emerged in black communities, it was actually as a wellness tool. It wasn't because, hey, we can make money at this wasn't because, hey, we're, we're, we're athletic. It's because we want to be athletic, right? So it's a slightly different paradigm. Um, but it took off from 100 fans that came to the first game between two independent African-American basketball teams in uh, Bushwick in Brooklyn in 1907 to uh, a couple of hundred later, then all of a sudden 1,000. And by the time you get to the Manhattan Casino, there's several thousand, 3,000, 6,000, and so on. The man on the cover of the book who has the carnation, cover of my book, is named Will Anthony Madden. And he is a pioneer in his own right that deserves enshrinement in the Basketball Hall of Fame because he created this team which was also one of the first professional teams in, in black basketball, the New York City Incorporators. He started out in abject poverty, born the same year that the Brooklyn Bridge was opened in 1883. And he lived in a section of New York City called Little Africa because that's where all the black people live, most of the black people, which is now Greenwich Village, section of Greenwich Village. He lived in such a way so that um, the 6th Avenue elevated train that came down 6th Avenue took a left on West 3rd Street, which is where the West 4th Street cage is, if you're familiar with streetball. But West 3rd was covered with this, with this elevated track that locomotives would, would turn and twist on 24 hours a day with steel dust and coal embers and other pieces of debris raining down on the citizens below, including Will Anthony Madden, who lived in one of those tenements. It was so poor that that same street was a subject of Jacob Reese's um, book, How the Other Half Lives, which was a social reform book that really was shocking at the time because people didn't realize how much poverty there was in New York, in New York City, but also in in uh, American cities. Now, John D. Rockefeller lived uptown near where the Museum of Modern Art is now, and he took that same train to work down in the Wall Street area because Standard Oil, which was his company, their headquarters was down there. 
in order to get down to work, he had to use that same track. So I make the point in the book that literally they were a few feet apart when the train passed over Will Anthony Madden's house. But they couldn't have been further apart, right? Because Rockefeller was at the top half, the top of the top of the that half. And Will Anthony Madden was probably near the bottom of the other half. But guess what? Eventually, Will Anthony Madden is working as a messenger at Standard Oil, walking the same hallways as John D. Rockefeller as a messenger. And I found that out because in doing research, if you look at the municipal archives in New York City, you can go to the street directory and the street directory would say not only your name, but also where you worked and what floor. So then I thought, who else was working at Standard Oil? And it turns out that his boss was a man named James Hoffman Woods, otherwise known as uh, uh, J.H. Woods, J. Hoffman Woods. And he was one of the co-founders of the Smart Set Athletic Club. So now the light bulbs are going off. I'm like, wait a minute. Who else worked there? And how did these people all get to know each other? Because it wasn't enough for me to just say, you know, in 1904, the, the Smart Set was founded. And then in 1907, the St. Christopher Club was founded. And then the Alphas came later. I had to know why. So the Alpha Physical Culture Club, the founders stayed at a West Indian boarding house uh, in, the, in Midtown. There was also the same place where the priest who came to work at the St. Christopher Club lived. And that's how they all got together to form this league, which I talk about in New York City. And, um, but what's interesting is, although Will Anthony Madden was born in poverty, he ends up as this messenger, but then also he ends up working his way to become the king of black basketball during the 1910s. And I tracked his life, and then I realized in the early 1970s when he died, he was buried in an unmarked grave. And I thought, that's really, that's really striking to me because I have, I have an empathy for giving voice to the voiceless. And that's when I start to realize, okay, who's speaking for these pioneers? Who's speaking for this person? Um, I got that just also from my, my grandparents and their histories as sharecroppers in Louisiana and other places. Like, who's speaking for this generation of people? But Will Anthony Madden, I use his life as a, as a through thread because I start with, what was going on to even prepare the world for the invention of basketball? And then what was happening in different cities like Pittsburgh? And then also eventually the integration of the NBA, which I'll get to and so on. But then I said, okay, well, this whole history is buried in an unmarked grave, right? Not just Will Anthony Madden. So I've made it my job to figure that out. Now realize I got straight D's in English in, in middle school. <laughs> so when I literally had to figure out how do I even write a book? Um, I started with blogging and other things. Uh, I started with uh, figuring out how to even go to do research in the library. Along the way in Pittsburgh, there were other figures besides Cumberland Posey. One of them is a man named Hunter Johnson who was the trainer at Pitt. He was the athletic trainer. He was also the athletic trainer for the Carnegie Tech football team. So this picture on the left is taken out of a yearbook at Pitt that I found in the Hillman Library. And the, and the photo on the right is taken out of a yearbook that I found at Carnegie Mellon in one of their libraries. And this is the same guy. And he also ended up being the trainer to DeHart Hubbard, who was the first African-American individual gold medalist in the long jump uh, in the 1924 Olympics. So... He's also an unsung hero, but there are different um, teams that he formed, like the Scholastic Basque, the uh, Scholastic Athletic Association. This is Scholastic Basketball. This is one of their teams. And by the way, along the way, when I found a team like this and I loved their logo or their name, I trademarked the name and the logo. So over the years, I eventually got this um, portfolio of intellectual property because I knew all along, Sam is wearing one of the jerseys. These are some of the logos. I knew all along that 
among among us in our community apparel and style is a language of its own we speak to one another through what we wear uh through the questions that are raised um through the through the answers waiting to happen from from the from the branding of these teams and so um that was my original goal when i saw smart set athletic club and it, and it was also when i saw some of these other teams as well um they weren't just black teams they're also white teams this is an all jewish team called the second story Maury's. there was a a haberdashery a clothing store in downtown pittsburgh owned by a man named maury goldman and it was on the second floor so his store was called second story maury's and everyone knew about second story maury's they formed a team and the man who's on the floor on the right side his name is chick davies now chick davies remember that name because i'll come back to it he left high school to join this team in order to take care of his mom, who was, who was a w recent widow. And they were extremely good as a team. They beat every all these other teams. And they also played against black teams like the Monticellos and later teams that Composey had formed. I also loved this logo. So this is also one of the logos in our, in our uh, collection of, of teams. But I mentioned Chick Davies because something happened with him later that you will find quite interesting. Composey, meanwhile, kept playing and he was so well known and renowned that sometimes he had to use a false name. And in this case, he joined the varsity basketball team and baseball team at Duquesne University. That's what that D stands for. So he played at Duquesne University under an assumed name, Charles Cumbert, for three years and was the leading scorer. And there's no evidence that he ever enrolled. <laughs> but while he was at Duquesne, Duquesne had a high school attached as well. And there was a young man who joined the football team at that high school, and his name was Art Rooney. And Art Rooney and Cumberland Posey became friends, where Composey was almost like a mentor to him. Cum knew about street smarts and, and about uh, angles and, and obviously athleticism and how to spot talent. And Art Rooney ended up becoming an entrepreneur, great football player as well, and also eventually formed the Pittsburgh Steelers. And so that relationship that they formed became extremely important because in the Negro Leagues, very few baseball teams had their own field. But not until Art Rooney, who let Art, who let Composey use Forbes Field for the Grays, and that gave him an ex extreme advantage. So much of an advantage that eventually when Cumberland Posey passed away, Art Rooney was a pallbearer at his funeral. So this shows you the types of relationships that are that are symbolic also of Pittsburgh at the end of the day. And by the way, now Cumberland Posey is in the Duquesne University Sports Hall of Fame under his real name. And Duquesne actually has an endowment uh, called the Cumberland Posey Endowment, which is for minority students at Duquesne. It provides scholarship funds for them. There were also these facilities like the Union Labor Temple on the hill on Webster Avenue. It's no longer there, but this also held 6,000 people. And people would flock here from miles around to uh, witness these games. An enormous facility. Cumberland Posey's dad was also a co-founder of the Pittsburgh Courier and of a club called the Lowendai Social and Literary Club, which was the most exclusive black social club in America for many years. It was founded in 1897, and it was for men of means 
and they had all kinds of club rooms and other things, and it was on a street called Fulton Street, later renamed Fullerton, which is no longer there, but also where the new um, hockey arena is now. Along the lines of these um, rivalries that they formed, there was another all-Jewish team called the Coffee Club that was founded and formed by uh, originally by a politician, and this was just to help his campaign, but even after the campaign was over, the team was so good that they just kept playing. And they ended up forming a relationship with Cumberland Posey because while Posey was playing at Duquesne, on the schedule was the coffee club. And so many fans from Pittsburgh came to that Pacific game that a light bulb went off in Cumberland Posey's head and said, wait a minute, we should be playing this team multiple times a year all over the place. In Ohio, in Pennsylvania, uh, in West Virginia, wherever we can go. And so they created this model of taking teams, pairing them up, and just going to different places, the same exact team. Because people want to see that. They just want to know, first, the sort of mock hysteria, racial hysteria of this white team playing this black team and touring around. And, wow, let's go watch that, because there's nothing else to do. But also because it was a moneymaker. And so um, over the years, this rivalry between the Lowendies and the coffee club, the games were rarely decided by more than a few points. And this was the kind of action that, that basketball fans wanted to see. Even before black basketball, Homestead specifically, and this area, was a hotbed for basketball. Homestead had two professional teams in two different leagues, the Central Basketball League and the and the uh, Professional Basketball League of Western Pennsylvania. And they just had teams all over the place. They had marches, you know, to open the season through downtown Homestead. Um, one of the teams was called uh, the, the, uh, the Hans Wagners because uh, Hans Wagner, Honus Wagner, was actually an exceptional basketball player. So much that he became a referee and he actually refereed games between all black teams in those days because people wanted to see him in a different uniform. Um, meanwhile, that low and die team ended up winning three, uh, four straight colored basketball world championships. This is an ad where they went to uh, play this team in, pit, in, uh, in uh, Philadelphia, the Panthers. And you can see there was a lot of hype and the ticket prices kept going up a little bit. There was always dancing. There was an orchestra. And all of this led to, eventually, the acceptance of professionalism once a man named Bob Douglas, who was from St. Kitts, arrived on the scene. And he had a team called the Spartan Braves, which was an amateur team. But when Prohibition came about in 1920, places like the Manhattan Casino, which I showed you the ad, had to jack up their rental prices to the point where Douglas and others couldn't afford it anymore. So he was the fast thinker, and he thought ahead, how can I get a home court? So he went to the owner of the newly constructed Renaissance Casino, which was a ballroom in Harlem, and said, look, I'll rename my team to the Renaissance, nicknamed the Rens, if you let me play at your home court. And so they formed this deal, and that's how the New York Rens were formed in 1923, 100 years ago. Now, the Rens played about 150 games a season, and they were formed in 1923, and by the time they dissolved in 1949, they had won more than 85% of their games over that period of time, defeating all the best teams, the original Celtics, the South Philadelphia Hebrew Association, the New York Whirlwinds, the Olsen's Terrible Swedes, everybody. You notice these names, right? There's an Irish team, a Jewish team, a Swedish team, a colored team. You had to 
signal what kind of a team you were before you showed up. But the question arises, why or how could an all-black team go to an all-white town like Oshkosh in an all-white state like Wisconsin win uh, decidedly, leave safely, and get invited back again and again. Well, that's what happened because these were mobile economic stimulus teams that would show up and people would come from miles around to spend money. And um, that's how this business model took place. Meanwhile, Will Anthony Madden took what was at the time the longest road trip in history when he took the New York Incorporators to Chicago in 1917. And on his way back, he stopped in about eight cities. And that was the inspiration, the original inspiration, along with Cumberland Posey for barnstorming in the first place. So when the Wrens went out on the, when they played their season, that 150 games, 90% of those games, 85% of those games were played on the road. So they had to travel in a bus that was a custom bus. Um, it had two heaters built in, coal heaters, pot belly stoves, one on the front, one in the back. They had two sets of uniforms. One they wore, because they sometimes had to play two games a day. Um, one would be the one that was drying in the wind, and the other one was the one they were about to wear. Um, and they were wool, so you had to really uh, be a believer <laughs> in order to uh, play on those teams. Um, their road manager, Eric Illich, would carry a loaded revolver in his pocket, and that's because they were sharing the gate receipts, and the gate receipts meant you had to count how many people came in. So he would stand there before the game, and he would just all he was doing was watching the front door, counting up who came in. And if that number didn't match at the end of the game when they met at half court to divvy up the cash, then you had to pull out that revolver. But you also had to pull out that revolver because there was so much cash involved that sometimes people would try to rob Mr. Illich. So he talks about that, and I talk about that in the book. And he also talks about how at the very beginning when they first went out, they had to, they had to get in fights and knock, knock their opponents out. He said, I had two guys on my team, and they had three or four jaws broken apiece among them uh, every year until we finally earned respect. Till we finally earned respect. And then they realized, okay, wow, these are good players. Okay, fine. But what did these black teams do? They made it possible or gave reason, incentive for these white teams to get better. They had to get better in order to compete. And so if you got beat down one year, the next year you're like, okay, let me get a center. Let me get a more athletic guard. Let me get, and they just got better because of that. And it's it slept on, right? This is what the contribution of these African-American teams was. It wasn't just, oh, we went out there and played and we paved the way for other black players. It's we made the whole game of basketball better. We made white teams better by being out here, right? One pointed example, and this is a scene from the New York Harlemites playing up in Montana. The New York Harlemites were a team that was based out of St. Louis. And this uh, photo comes from one of the descendants of a player on that team who, uh, who was on this team when they traveled to Montana in 1937 um, with a series of games scheduled on their, on, their, uh, on their calendar. But they ran into a blizzard, and this blizzard took place the same week that temperatures were minus 40 recorded that, that week. Their car broke down. They had to walk three miles. And they were finally rescued by a sheep herder who took them into his hut. And eventually they got hospitalized and treated for frostbite. So their hands were bandaged. But because they had a schedule to meet, right? So literally miles to go uh, before they sleep and promises to keep, they kept going. 
and they played the next game with bandaged hands and won. And this is recorded in the newspapers. But one thing happened. One of the players got frostbite so bad that he developed gangrene and he had to get sent home to St. Louis. And the only treatment for gangrene is amputation, at least back then. His mom refused to have that happen, so he died. The newspaper said, the boys played well, despite the loss of their teammate who died of gangrene. Now, you process that and you realize that it was more than about basketball. It was more than about the game. It was more than winning. It was literally paving the way because if you didn't keep up with your schedule, who knows if that next black team would get invited, right? Who knows if you get accused of being soft? Who knows if you can, you can keep at it the next time around? So this was an important distinction to make, and it was one that is also often overlooked, is the popularity of basketball in far remote rural places is also because of these teams who were considered heroes when they came to town. The reason I know that, by the way, is because I've, uh, we developed a relationship with the daughter of one of the players on that team who told us that story, which then made us do the actual digging to verify and confirm all the other newspaper articles and so on. Chick Davies, who I mentioned earlier, ended up becoming the head coach at Duquesne University. And while he was at Duquesne, he recruited Chuck Cooper from Westinghouse High School. So this is Coach Davies with Chuck Cooper. Chuck Cooper ended up being the first African-American player drafted into the NBA in 1950. Earl Lloyd was the first player to play. He was also drafted Washington Capitals. And then Nat Sweetwater Clifton was the first to sign a contract with the New York Knicks. So there's a relationship here where Cumberland Posey on 13th Avenue in Homestead lived a couple of doors down from Chick Davies. And I read a blurb someplace where it mentioned that the basket that had been nailed to the Duquesne power and light pole near the Posey's home all these years ago had finally been taken down. So I thought, well, when was it put up? So I looked it up and I found out when all the light poles were put in. And um, then I started to realize there were all these other players from the area who had great nicknames that ended up shooting baskets on that same uh, makeshift basket and backboard on 13th Ave in Homestead alongside Cumberland Posey, his brother Seward, and others. And these players ended up going to these professional leagues, the Central League that I mentioned, the Western Pennsylvania Basketball League, and the Eastern League and other leagues. And so during that time, it was a golden era of basketball for Pittsburgh and especially for Homestead because the players and coaches who emerged out of that became famous. I write about all that in, in my book. And whatever happened with the unmarked grave of Will Anthony Madden? Well, first I want to say that the mascot at the bottom um, is this guy named Walter Cooper, his brother. Walter Cooper is the center at the very back. The mascot ended up being the man who, after moving to Harlem, founded and organized Showtime at the Apollo. So he ended up uh, creating movies for Lena Horne and others. And Lena Horne, her grandfather, was one of the co-founders of the Smarts at Athletic Club. So all these things go together. But we ended up giving Mr. Madden his official formal gravestone with proper recognition. After he played basketball, he went into 
uh, became a, a journalist, a poet. Um, he was an entertainer. And uh, when he died, you know, he only had seven silver dollars in his possession. And because he was buried intestate with, without heirs or descendants or friends or anybody next of kin to claim his body, they had to auction all of his belongings off. But before they did, the surrogate court listed everything, and I was able to get that record as well. Another th record that I was able to get, which if you're a researcher, you can appreciate this, we know that there's no known place where the New York Amsterdam News from 1910 when it was formed to 1920, that got lost. Those records got lost. Nobody knows what happened. They burned. There are no issues of the New York Amsterdam News from 1910 when it was organized to 1920. But Will Anthony Madden, when he left the St. Christopher Club to form the Incorporators, took some things with him that the St. Christopher Club didn't like that he did that, so they sued him, and it went all the way to the New York State Supreme Court. In the New York State Supreme Court dockets, which I, of course, had to look up because I'm obsessed like that, I looked at the depositions and the affidavits, and guess what? Within those depositions, there was evidence, and one of the evidences was all these newspaper clippings from the Amsterdam News from 1910s. And one of them mentioned that Will Anthony Madden had these grand ideas for creating an all-black basketball league. And so this is one of, one of the benefits of my book is that I'm uncovering, literally unburying, unearthing information and, and um, facts that were never known before. But they, they definitely position Mr. Madden as a candidate for the Basketball Hall of Fame. And when he took that team to Chicago, he had hired at a point earlier than that a white coach from the Lower East Side. Lower East Side was known for their amazing Jewish basketball teams at the time. Uh, so he hired this man named uh, Jeff Wetzler. Wetzler introduced what was known as scientific basketball to black teams because of Will Anthony Madden. Will Anthony Madden was way ahead of his time. He not only had a white coach, but he also had white Jewish players from the Lower East Side on his all-black New York Incorporators team when they went to Chicago. But it was a bad timing because 1917, that was right after the East St. Louis Massacre, which was a warm-up, if you want to call it that, in a grotesque way, for the 1921 Tulsa Massacre. And when he got there, and the team went out on the court. This was at the, this was at the Eighth Regiment Armory on the South Side, and they were playing the the Wabash Colored YMCA Outlaws. People weren't having it, and it was it caused a riot on the court, and that riot made some of the newspapers, the black newspapers in New York, vilify um, Mr. Madden. But the Chicago Defender called his team the democracy lads, because that was also World War I, right? Make the world safe for democracy. So what better way than to have an integrated team? What's wrong with that? Why not? Novel concept, but he was way ahead of his time. And he got exiled out of basketball for 50 years. And I'm not going to give it away, but he gets his vindication towards the end of the book and after he gets his vindication, again, I won't explain it, but um, we now have a proper gravestone for him. You'll have to read the drama of it uh, when you get to the end of it, when you get to the end of it. If you want to cheat, you can just read the last chapter. It's called Vindication. But don't cheat. <laughs> um, so I, I, I say that because, because you know, he's definitely a candidate for the Basketball Hall of Fame. Um, there are many other stories like this that emerged, details that intertwined. It's, um, 
When I set out to write this book, I didn't know how to research. I practically didn't know how to write. I had to find my voice. I didn't know what that was. I was charting all this information, but it was just information. It wasn't a story. I learned how to make it into a story. And I did that partly through understanding that giving voice to the voiceless, that's what feels right. Um, and so, you know, yes, we started a foundation, a nonprofit, and that has helped. And we've been able to get a lot of um, access to uh, people that want this, this information, that are hungry for it. Players, NBA teams, they, we're doing something with the A-10 um, next week, actually. I'm coming back here for that, um, which includes Duquesne. Um, but you should think of it as a basketball trained or a black basketball trained that you're riding in, but you're looking out the windows. And what's going by is this scenery called black history, American history. And ultimately, this is a book about America. It's a book about the history of African Americans. And the way you read it, it could also be a book about Will Anthony Madden and these pioneers. I try to humanize them. I try to talk about their mother, their father, their decisions, their movements, where they came from, what they did, how they thought, what they were feeling like, um, because they're not just statistics, they're people. So they're really characters. And one thing I can say is that I left a lot of loose ends on purpose because I think I want to pick up where I left off. Even though it's 480 pages, it's got 1,300 endnotes. So if you want to do the research on this, you know, definitely it's all there for you. I wanted to make it the mic drop of this history, which means there's nothing else that can be said because I said it all. You can't go back any further. It's like the genesis of, of this history. But I, I, I say that as a challenge because if somebody wants to do that, it's there. It's there for you, you know? So no mic drop is ever really final because somebody else comes along, picks up the mic and blows you away. <laughs>